Susan Neiman is director of the Einstein Forum in Potsdam, Germany, a position she's held since the year 2000. She's lived in Germany uh, more than three decades. She has a doctorate in philosophy from Harvard. She's taught at Yale. After having worked in the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, she's an American by birth, born in Atlanta. Uh, she's the author of several scholarly books, but I think she's best known to American lay readers for a remarkable book that we did a podcast about uh, a few years ago that was written in 2019 called Learning from the Germans. Uh, the subtitle is Race and the Memory of Evil. And her point to summarize a complicated book is that Germany is really the one country that has accepted responsibility for past evil in a way that the United States has only very partially done, really hasn't done. And you could go through all of the countries that have attempted this, including South Africa. Germany's the one country that has really come to terms from this. And there are things we can learn from the Germans. However, uh, I wanted to have this conversation with Susan because of her newest book, which uh, wh whose, whose title uh, uh, is Fighting Words, Left is Not Woke. Those are fighting words. So why don't we start, Susan, by explaining what you mean by that? The book came about because of a series of conversations that I was having with friends over the past couple of years in various countries. And my guess is that you and probably anybody who's listening to this podcast will have had the same conversation in one form or another. And it went like this. Look what just happened and point to some um, news item in which... Uh, that's what was described as an excess of zeal resulted in someone's being canceled. And uh, friend one would say to friend two, gosh, if this is left, I guess I'm not left anymore. And I found myself in increasingly annoyed by those conversations and saying, wait a second, um, you know, you're left and I'm left and we have been so all our lives. What is being done in this particular case is not left. All right. So I set out to try and in fairly simple terms uh, describe what really is left and what uh, is woke. And my very short version uh, of the result is to say that what's confusing about the whole conversation, the set of conversations we've been having, is that woke appeals to traditional progressive emotions, traditional uh, left-wing emotions, sympathy for the marginalized, um, outrage at various forms of oppression, determination to right historical wrongs, all of those are theories that I very much share and support. No, all of those are emotions that I very much uh, share. What doesn't, what, what's confusing is that the theories on which the woke base their views are actually quite reactionary. Now, this does not mean that um, everybody who's woke is uh, going around reading Foucault all day or Heidegger or Carl Schmitt. I don't discuss Heidegger in too much detail because that's been done very well in a recent book by Richard Wallen. Um, I mentioned him, of course, but I do talk about Foucault and um, Schmitt as providing the background assumptions for much of the woke. And once again, you don't have to actually have read either of those authors, though my guess is that almost anybody who went to college read one book of Foucault's there and, you know, vaguely took it with them. But these are assumptions that wind up in every newspaper or every magazine article without actually being thought about. So how's that for a beginning? Okay. So let's, uh, before we get to Foucault and Heidegger, which may scare off some of our audience. Um, let's talk about what you believe, and I've read the book and I agree with you, uh, 
what's the essence of left? And then let's talk about what's the essence of the woke sensibility and why the woke sensibility is really, leaving aside Foucault and company, why the woke sensibility is at odds with what we as good leftists believe and how it gives ammunition to the right. So, uh, uh, and I could quote some passages from the book where you th I, I think you do this quite eloquently, but um, as I understand it, you argue, and I certainly agree with this, that the essence of left is universalism. And uh, the essence of woke is particularism where you are defined by your marginalized ethnic group, which then leads us down all kinds of rabbit holes. So would you unpack that for us? What, what in your view is the essence of left? Sure. Well, I um, identify three principles that I think are common both to liberals and to the left, and then a fourth one that distinguishes between uh, liberal and left. So yes, universalism is the very first principle um, that distinguishes left from right, always has, always did. For the right, the belief is the only people you will ever have real connections with, and therefore the only people you have real obligations to are members of your own tribe. And it has always been the essence of uh, the left, really since the Enlightenment, to say, no, there's a common humanity that goes beyond differences of tribes and clans. This is not to say that particular histories aren't interesting and important, but what's most politically important is a common human dignity that needs to be respected. And that can be found in anyone, anywhere, um, and that is what, and we aspire to connect with, and we have obligations to anyone, anywhere, simply on the basis of human dignity. And that is our first form of, of uh, identification, if you like. Now, um, we have to go just a little bit into theory because post-colonial theory, which does depend on Foucault, and you know, is is very ascendant even among people who don't um, don't read any theoretical stuff. Holds that the very idea of universalism is a Eurocentric sham. Uh, to um, you know, pull the wool over the eyes of the rest of the world by defining humanity in Eurocentric terms. Um, I'm denying that, and I can go later into um, why I deny that, but there are a couple of other principles that I think are equally um, essential to the left and that are equally denied by certain kinds of woke theory. One is the idea that it's possible to make a principal distinction between justice and power. Now, we can all think of cases in which claims to justice or claims to virtue have in fact only been attempts to um, uh, disempower other people. Um, the war in Iraq is a standard and great example. Um, I'm sure neither you nor I believed the Bush regime uh, was actually serious about spreading democracy in the Middle East, but somehow they got away with claiming that. Um, interestingly enough, um, Europeans still kind of believe them. Europeans still think that um, the stated goal of the Bush administration um, at, in invading Iraq, namely to spread democracy in the Middle East, was its real goal. Um, and then it just concludes, well, Americans are naive that they think that they can spread democracy on the point of a gun and so on. Um, I don't think either of us, I think Americans were savvier in that particular case and seeing through that what were actually claims to virtue and justice were really simple claims to power. And of course, there are all kinds of ways in which those in history in which those claims get confused. But for liberals and leftists, it's absolutely necessary that it's in principle possible to make the distinction because otherwise you're back to sort of feudal relationships in which simply the stronger per party says, um, 
I'm taking this land or this government or this country because I'm bigger than you are and I can do it, all right? So a principal distinction between justice and power. Thirdly, a belief in the possibility of progress and uh, not uh, the inevitability of progress as it's often caricatured, but the possibility of progress. And this too is an idea that comes from the enlightenment, all right? Um, before the Enlightenment, you basically had the idea that, uh, you know, life on Earth was a matter of woe. Um, you know, maybe things were better in a golden age, and maybe things might get better if you die and get to go to heaven. But the idea that human beings working together could actually uh, improve their own and other people's lives is a new idea. We've come to take it for granted so that once again, we listen to um, fundamentally reactionary theorists like Foucault, who tells us that every attempted effort towards progress, every step forward is actually a more subtle form of repression. And once again, you need not have read Foucault to, um, to find this kind of view um, once again, in any serious newspaper or news magazine, the idea that um, what looked like progress, so look, let, me, let me put it this way, in order to believe that we can make progress in the future, you actually have to believe that we made progress in the past. So the kind of deconstruction that we uh, sometimes see in contemporary historical reckoning uh, which don't say, well, look, um, Lincoln only went so far, say. Um, and thank heaven we could we can go further. But our ability to go further than Abraham Lincoln in combating racism uh, has to be made on the shoulders of Abraham Lincoln and other people like him who died for the rights of African Americans. But instead of saying that, which would be a progressive view um, and a view that might celebrate the fact that we're actually able to go further than Lincoln was in fighting uh, racism, you have people saying, you know, Lincoln was a racist, he didn't get anywhere. There's, you know, we're still living in, uh, in a world that's just as racist as it was in 1865. Let, let me I make see it. ask something. There's one more. Those yeah. three principles are the principles that I think are common both to leftists and liberals. And there's one more uh, further step that you go if you situate yourself on the left. Shall I um, mention that or do you want to ask about the first men, three? Men, mention that in passing and then we'll come back to it because I had a couple of comments. Okay. Um, so what distinguishes uh, leftists from liberals is that leftists like me believe that um, a whole series of things like education and workers' rights and uh, healthcare, parental leave, vacation, housing, all of those are social rights. Liberals call them benefits, or uh, entitlements or safety nets. But all of those things are written into the 1948 UN Declaration on Human Rights, which was ratified by most countries that were member of the, members of the UN at the time. And it's an entirely different conceptual way of looking at those things. Um, you know, you can regard them as benefits, something that you're lucky to have, or you or that are granted by say your employer, or like uh, all of Western Europe does, you can regard them as things that are uh, human rights as deep and important as say, freedom of speech or the right to travel. And no country has ever realized all of those rights. But if you're on the, uh, if you're on the left, you believe that social rights are not utopian, but genuine rights to be worked for. Okay, so to recap, uh, to be a liberal or a leftist is to believe uh, in, in universal principles of justice, to believe that progress is possible, 
that it's not naive to believe that progress is possible uh, and that progress has actually happened. And um, to be left of liberal is to believe in social rights, not just as sort of things that the welfare state might might add. And furthermore, and I, I, uh, uh, I think you're debunking of uh, people who say, well, the Enlightenment is just a Eurocentric plot. It is devastating because most of the people who argue that have never read any Enlightenment philosophers mm -hmm. who, were, who were passionate anti-colonialists and who believed in universal human values and traits, uh, whether you were African or Asian or Native American or white uh, European, and even for the more venturesome uh, Enlightenment scholars, whether you were male or female. Okay, so now let's go back to Lincoln and Jefferson. I think, and you are also very eloquent on this, this is something you and I both believe, one of the fallacies of wokeism, and then we can come back to what wokeism is, Having, having said what leftism is. One of the fallacies of locus, wokeism is to fail to locate historical figures as figures of their own time. And you would not expect Jefferson or Lincoln to have the sensibility of Martin Luther King, much less of Black Lives Matter. You, you have to look at Lincoln as someone who was quite radical for the 1850s and ditto Jefferson. And so the, the, the effort to kind of pull down statues, not just of Robert E. Lee, but maybe of Jefferson or Lincoln, um, that to me is, is an example of uh, woke excess. And there are lots of other examples. And what, what ends up happening is that wokeism, by trying to be more left than thou, ends up uh, really splintering the progressive coalition and giving a lot of ammunition to the right and uh, ending up being an unwitting ally of neoliberals and, and absolute reactionaries. And, and I wanna come back to that uh, in a moment, but um, let, me, let me take a stab at what I think wokeism is and then help me Go out. <laughs> um, and I, I, I sent you a very courageous essay by Maurice Mitchell, mm -hmm. who is now the, National Director of the Working Families Party, and was formerly uh, a leader of Black Lives Matter. And um, it's a very courageous essay. He's African-American because he's taking on wokeism, not quite in so many words, but in essence. And he says, it's a mistake to use one's identity or personal experience as a justification for one's political position. That's a trap. And he also says, 40 million black folk in this country, some have great politics, some don't. And one's racial or gender identity or uh, experience in a marginalized community is not in and of itself a sufficient mandate for that uh, perspective to prevail. Now, that's uh, a very difficult thing for a white person to say without taking a risk of getting canceled. And I have trod very lightly on this. You've been rather more courageous than I have. Maybe it's a little easier to do from Potsdam. But um, I think the one foray that I made was, was taking on the, the barbaric term Latinx, which violates uh, the, 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 the rules of Spanish and which the vast majority of Spanish people, Hispanic people don't use because they think it's ridiculous. But I think what happens is um, uh, there, there's a there's a wonderful phrase by by uh, the the German Protestant theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, "Cheap grace, cheap grace." Oh, good. And a lot of a lot of the invention of language, and a lot of the efforts to police language, is a form of cheap grace. It's a lot easier to police language than it is to achieve real social change. So that's my two cents. Tell us your sense of what wokeism is, why it's counterproductive, what, what, what its essence is. Well, I basically agree with everything that you just said and would add as far as um, uh, the policing of language goes. I think this is um, 
these are actions that are born from despair. I think let's let's not forget woke was not even a term in 2016. People were talking about political correctness. It was a marginal. I mean, a few people were using it. It comes originally out of black culture. It was first used by the bluesman um, Lead Belly in 1936 and a song about the Scottsboro brothers, but it didn't come into common parlance until the Trump era. And frankly, I think that um, the emphasis on policing language really is um, born out of the sense that, well, we can't make any changes in the real world, but at least we can change our language. I realize, you know, I'll offend some people by saying that. And I'll add, yeah, I've had people say to me that it's easier for me to write this book from abroad um, than it is from, I live in Berlin, I, you know, uh, people have said, you're lucky that you're not teaching at an American university. Um, two answers to that. One is, um, I think people in the States don't realize just quite how wed widespread American wokeism has become. Uh, certainly in Europe, I've had requests to publish the book, books being published in Korea. Um, it's coming out in Brazil. This is an international phenomenon. It did start in American universities, but it, it, it certainly hasn't stopped there. So I'm um, going to be interested in what sort of shit storms uh, I get as the book comes <laughs> out in other places. I think it's the first place it's come out is Holland uh, going there next week. I think it's doing very well. But um, uh, I was in the States just uh, a few weeks ago talking about the book to different audiences. And I, I really had the sense that if all of us who had these qualms spoke up, um, we could um, we could weather the attempted cancellations together because I certainly felt that it was um, getting a lot of resonance. One thing that one experience that I have had um, as um, as an American Jew living abroad probably contributed to my um, uh, well, definitely contributed to my writing this book and perhaps to my boldness or relative boldness in talking about these things. You mentioned my book, uh, Learning from the Germans, which um, I still think is a good book, but I have to write a piece called What I Learned Since I Wrote Lear Learning from the Germans, which I've done in um, German but it's easier to do in German because the context is there. In fact, things have changed both in Germany and in the United States in the four years since I published that book. And one of the things that has happened is out of a misplaced sense of urgency and guilt, there has been a campaign in Germany to um, a sort of hyper, um, hypersensitivity against any perceived form of anti-Semitism, which has included criticizing uh, any criticism of the state of Israel. Now, as American listeners will know, because it's, uh, it's all available in your media, uh, precisely as the occupation has been getting worse, as, um, um, you know, the Israeli government has been moving further towards the right, including people who call themselves fascists. Germany has um, sort of ramped up its uh, expressions of guilt and has said, yes, but the Holocaust to any, uh, any criticism of what's going on in the state of Israel. And any Jew or Israeli, like me, who speaks out against the Israeli government has been called by Germans anti-Semitic. Now, all of this, you're smiling, it's funny, I know, it's very hard to convey. It's extremely- Oh, I'm shaking my head. <laughs> it's, it's extremely complicated, but it's, it's, um, it's what I've been politically involved in the past two and a half years. And it strikes me as having extremely important parallels with what's going on with the United States, because 
if you try to do his, if, if you're very um, serious and important attempt at historical reckoning, that is coming to some terms with the crimes committed by part of your nation against other parts of your nation. But if what you then do is make the voice of the victim the only voice you listen to and prioritize victim identity over anything else, um, you can get into enormous trouble. Um, you know, we don't quite have a parallel for what's happening in, um, in Israel-Palestine in the American scene. But the attempting, as you said, to derive your politics solely from your ethnic identity. Or your can, victim. Your, well, let's look at how ethnic identity actually gets defined. It's ethnic and gender identity are the two parts of people's identity that are foregrounded right now. I don't actually believe that anybody has any essential identity with a possible exception of human being, if that's an essential identity, it's really sort of more of a framework. Uh, I think all of us have um, a number of identities. They can uh, grow or recede in importance at different times and essentializing any one part of them uh, used to be considered completely reactionary or even racist or sexist. All of the sudden, people are expected to speak as an African American, you know, as a lesbian, as uh, whatever it is. Um, I have this view, which is then a view that's um, not based on a complex of identities, which it might have been but on exactly the two components of identity over which we have the least control. And that's really quite interesting, okay? Um, so, you know, the two components of identity that we don't control and that have often put us in the position of being victims are the ones that are prioritized politically. And that seems to me to be a tremendous mistake um, originally, the concept of intersectionality, you might have thought, um, was a way of acknowledging that we all have different identities and, and you know, more than one, but it's turned into um, shorthand for some people are victims in more than one way. Now, I don't deny that. And I, I, mean, I think it's certainly important to point to the fact that Black women have experienced um, discrimination and marginalization, both because they're Black and because they're women. But so if that's a conception of, of intersectionality, um, I have no, uh, you know, there's, there's no way to argue empirically with that claim, okay? Um, what I'm arguing against is prioritizing those parts of our identity that, um, that leave us the least agency and base our political and moral decisions on that. And that's unfortunately something that um, woke has done. I mean, in a certain sense, I define woke as the negation of the three principles of the left that I mentioned. So it prioritizes tribalism and particularly um, those pieces of identity that are most likely to make someone a victim and over which a person has the least amount of control. Um, in being concerned about inequalities of power, it often simply focuses on power struggles rather than um, thinking about justice, which often gets left by the wayside. And thirdly, although of course the woke are um, consider themselves to be in the battle for progress, but once again, if all you see in history um, is attempted progress that failed, you will never be able to make any progress in the future. Okay, so a couple of comments and now uh, another question. Um, it seems to me that if people who embrace 
that view of what it means to be woke are trying to transform power, they're often going about it in a perverse way in a couple of respects. First of all, by making demands on the rest of the progressive community, you have to show us that you are a better ally by doing thus and such. Otherwise, you're just a false ally. It's self-marginalizing. Not enough of the rest of the progressive community is going to meet the purity test to be considered a real ally. And so instead of expanding your power coalition, you're going to narrow it. And secondly, you're presenting an easily caricatured set of propositions that the right is just going to make hay with witness uh, Santis. And uh, I don't want to turn what is an elegant book of moral philosophy into a tactical manual, but let's take a few minutes and talk about what we do about DeSantis and company, because what has happened is that the, the right wing's caricature of wokeism has become a basis for embracing old fashioned racism. It's not that I'm a uh, racist, heaven forbid, it's that I'm anti-woke, but one ends up being a cover for the other. Sure. So let's take a few moments and talk about what in the world we do about that, both as the broad progressive left, but also uh, in, a, in a more tactical sense. Because if you think about it, some of the older conceptions of racial progressivism, like say affirmative action, were much more viable brands than some of the newer, more highly refined linguistic inventions like diversity, equity, and inclusion. So why take a brand uh, of framing that had majority support, affirmative action, mm -hmm. uh, polls well in the majority figures among corporations, uh, among ordinary white people. Uh, even though the Supreme Court may strike down affirmative action, most Americans think, yeah, affirmative action is okay. But the further out on the woke continuum of linguistics you get, the more unpopular and suspect these uh, these contrivances are, and the more uh, you give you give ammunition to the right. I just want to pause that for one second and not forget to to make the following comment. In reading your most recent book, uh, Left Is Not Woke, I notice one other interesting difference in emphasis between that and your earlier book, Learning from the Germans. In Learning from the Germans, you were comparing the American experience of reckoning with Jim Crow with, with the German experience of reckoning with the Holocaust. And you found the American experience quite wanting. In, in one of the penultimate sections of your new book, you said, well, actually, if you think about it, um, there has been a lot of progress. Look, look at what race relations were like when I was growing up in the, in the 60s and look what they are now. And even though there's been a terrible amount of backsliding since Trump, we've actually had a lot of progress. So you're, you're leavening your earlier comment with a reminder not to give in to nihilism in the spirit of warning that if we're not careful, wokeism can be a council of despair and wokeism can lead to nihilism. Do I have that right? You have that absolutely right. Um, I mean, the difference is, you, you know, if a, if a book is published in 2019, um, it's usually handed in at the end of 2018, which is what happened with that book. Let's think where we were. Um, you know, this is before the, um, the New York Times 1619 project. This is before Black Lives Matter or, or when Black Lives Matter was embryonic, before George Floyd was murdered. Um, we have actually the, the Mississippi, the Confederate flag was still flying in Mississippi and no one, I believe, had taken down a statue of a, of a Confederate general. So, you know, my my more, shall I say, um, uh, positive view of what's, what the U.S. has done 
in regard to its own past is a reflection of the fact that an awful lot has been done in the past four and a half years. It's really, it's really quite striking. And much of that are uh, actions that I value. I think the Confederate statues should be gone. I think that thinking about those matters is important. I think that um, learning about this period from the end of the Civil War to the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott, which for most people, and not only white people, was a hole in our collective national memory, um, you know, leading to people like Hillary Clinton making mistakes that you would never make today, like confusing Reconstruction and Jim Crow. She she did that in 2016. So, you know, we have moved forward in a very, very um, serious way. I'm just worried that we're going off the rails. And uh, again, um, you know, so uh, let, let me go, but let me go back to what you said about allies and perhaps what you said about tactics. I do think tactically because I'm a, uh, as far as I can be, I'm a sometime activist as much as I am a philosopher. And um, I left the university um, for a public institution where I could function as a public intellectual, which I do um, in Europe. Um, so I care about tactics. And I'm terrified, as I say at the end of the book, about some version of a repeat of what happened in Germany in 1933, when most people know um, the Nazis did not come to power by winning a democratic majority. The left-wing parties had a very clear majority. I have seen posters, January 1933, with headlines, Berlin stays red. Okay, because Berlin was always a left-wing um, uh, city. But because of infighting between different left-wing groups, all of whom felt that their scorn and hatred of the other was entirely justified, um, the fascists came to power. We have fascist movements all over the world right now. Um, and... Uh, you know, historians of fascism think this is not at all um, an exaggeration. It's something to be genuinely worried about. So yes, uh, like you, I am worried about the left splitting itself over these kinds of issues. But I also think that tactics improve when the ideas behind the tactics improve. And that's the reason I wrote this book, which was to try to say, so among other things, I'm not an ally. An ally is the wrong relationship to have to a freedom struggle. Uh, again, to go back to the Nazi example, Hannah Arendt wrote that Eichmann should not have been indicted for crimes against the Jewish people. He should have been uh, indicted for crimes against humanity. And she was right. She didn't make as big a deal out of that as she should have, because I don't think the issues uh, could possibly have been as clear as they are now. Um, I can support um, justice for African-Americans, not as an ally. An ally is somebody who is whose interests are temporarily aligned with your own, like the United States and uh, the Soviet Union during the Second World War. But as soon as their interests were not aligned, uh, you know, they were at each other's uh, nuclear throats, okay? Um, an ally is someone who shares your principles and who shows solidarity with you on the basis of shared principles, not shared interests. And, uh, you know, so I say I'm, I'm not an ally. You, you, you kindly said I, I worked in the civil rights movement. I was a little bit too young for that. I wish I had been. I'm, it's more accurate to say I grew up in the middle of the civil rights movement. And it, it, um, it certainly shaped me, um, particularly growing up in the South. And I can remember a song called Medgar Evers Lullaby, which ended with the words, all men are slaves till their brothers are free. And that's the kind of sentiment that was certainly behind all of the 
um, progressive movements in the U.S. and elsewhere uh, in the 30s, in the 40s, um, before that as well, um, that's how people were united. And that is, of course, the point behind um, you know, social democracy. So um, again, a couple of comments. You are very respectful, appropriately so, I think, to uh, the original movement for Black Lives and the the response, outpouring of response in, in reaction to the murder of George Floyd, which, which was probably the, the, as you say, the, the, the greatest example of, let's use the word solidarity, let's not use the word ally, mm -hmm. uh, maybe since the, the early civil rights movement of- uh, More, of more. Now, According to people like Harry Belafonte and, and certain you know forms of social scientists, okay? There were more white people out on the streets in right. the middle of a plague for which there was no vaccination um, than there were people of color. And it was the largest social movement in um, American history. So I think since then, um, wokeism has become a more narrow, uh, less uh, universal, universalistic uh, movement, if you will. I won't even call it a movement, but it's more uh, a kind of demand for purity. And uh, I, I think those of us who teach at universities find that universities come up with ways of, of demanding purity that are and I have to be careful here because I don't <laughs> teach university, university. <laughs> that that are occasionally uh, irritating and galling, and that that use the wrong tests of who's a good person and who has compassion and who has solidarity. But the horse is out of the barn, and in this case, the horse is DeSantis. Now, DeSantis may destroy himself. I mean, he's really doing a brilliant job of destroying himself. But leaving aside DeSantis, you you do have. Uh, uh, censorship, you do have don't say gay, you do have all kinds of um, uh, excesses and, and, and you do have all kinds of manifestations of racism that define themselves in terms of, well, this is just anti-woke, I'm not racist, I'm not sexist, I'm not uh, censoring books, I'm just uh, supporting the rights of parents. And this is this is very insidious stuff. So as leftists, as progressives, even as liberals, uh, since you have admitted to being a tactician as well as a moral philosopher, how do we combat that? I think we have to engage in self-criticism. We have to get out of this binary um, way of thinking and acting, which so many of us have been in, which is that if we criticize woke if we criticize the woke, we're uh, fueling the fires of, you know, Ron DeSantis or in Britain, Richie Sunak. I mean, I had a couple of friends beg me not to use woke in the title of this book. Um, uh, you know, they said I would be giving aid and comfort to the right. And, you know, since the word is mostly used as a ter term of abuse at this moment, I should simply leave it. And I... I did, it did give me pause. I thought about um, changing it, but you know, this is the kind of thinking that leads you really into block thinking and, and um, can actually, um, I mean, it just doesn't help anybody. I think all of us, and I know that there are millions of, you know, people who understand themselves as liberals, people who understand themselves as leftists or progressives, whatever they call themselves, there are millions of people who are really upset about this, who are upset about things, for example, like the charge of cultural appropriation, um, which is fairly nonsensical um, and inconsistent, all right? Um, you know, the idea that culture belongs to a certain group and, um, uh, you know, only people who were born into a tribe have the right to talk about, perhaps le even learn about, I guess people are allowed to learn silently about another 
culture. Um, but they, they they certainly shouldn't study it as a matter, and they certainly you, shouldn't. You, you, you draw a very useful distinction between so-called cultural appropriation and cultural exploitation, which is to be condemned. But I mean, if you look at a, a genre like jazz, where you have influences going back and forth and back and forth, uh, it's not the same as exploitation. And uh, uh, Paul Simon took a huge amount of abuse for uh, drawing on, on African uh, music, even though in the course of so doing, he publicized it. And there, there are all of these uh, examples and one has to, you know, one has to sort this out very carefully. I, I, so I don't know the, um, you know, the backstory to Graceland. I have heard that he actually didn't pay his South African musicians appropriately. If he did pay them appropriately, which I hope he did, it's a fantastic album, you know, which has elements of South, you know, different South African traditions, but also it's a mix. Most serious pieces of culture are a mix of different traditions. And right. so first of all, for that reason, it's ridiculous to try to um, uh, you know, identify a piece of culture as belonging to one tribe. Secondly, even if they're not, the best way for us to understand another culture and to get a sense both of their difference from us and their similarity is to get inside a piece of their culture, you know, so so that the stricture on on cultural appropriation is uh, is really it's the most counterproductive thing you could possibly do. There's also something that's completely incoherent. I was thinking about this when a friend of mine from Senegal brought me as a gift, which he didn't have to give me, but I had invited him to a workshop and he brought me an absolutely gorgeous sort of robe thing from Senegal. Now I happen to, um, I was in Senegal. I love um, Senegalese uh, artworks. And I I thought about, you know, well, would would it have occurred to him that if I wear this gift that he brought me from his culture, that I would be culturally appropriating. I mean, this is just, uh, you know, Berlin is difficult. One goes and visits people. If, if sometimes one wants to bring a gift that they couldn't have gotten wherever one is, one tries to find something, you know, from the place one lives or the place one is going to. It's, um, it's, a, you know, the best kind of cultural exchange. But the other thing that, of course, becomes bizarre about the uh, reproach of cultural uh, appropriation are things like the utter success of Hamilton, um, you know, and I mean, or Bridgerton, to name a much lower quality uh, piece of popular art. Um, and um, Hamilton is a fantastic musical, and I, I had the chance finally to see it live rather than just on film. But I totally fail to understand why, you know, how one can maintain the strict reproach of cultural, uh, against cultural appropriation and still applaud Hamilton. So what we have is a kind of incoherent set of, of claims that um, make no sense. And I think it's absolutely time that people who are progressive, I mean, we're talking about them to go back to how to fight Ron DeSantis, for people on the left to say, you know, some of this really bothers me too. Um, I'm still angry at Biden for saying he was going to appoint a black woman. Why didn't he just appoint Katanji? Brown? Oh, looks as if she's going to be a terrific Supreme Court justice. Why take away her achievement, okay, by saying from the beginning, I'm going to appoint a black woman? Um, in the situations in which I'm aware that somebody has given me something because they needed a woman, I'm furious, okay? Um, you know, it it undercuts uh, 
whatever I did as a thinker and a writer to um, realize that somebody wants to invite me to something in order to check off a DEI box. I'm not, of course, saying that as in affirmative action used well, we should be aware that diversity is one value. Uh, because if we don't, we're likely to wind up just reproducing old patterns and not being open um, to people who traditionally didn't get into the gates, okay? But this kind of rigidity, um, it's frankly, it's an insult to Katanji Brown Jones um, to, to um, have said from the beginning, I'm going to appoint a black woman. Um, it's an absurdity to suggest that culture belongs to only the tribe that produced it, even if you can identify it. And I think that we could undercut a lot of the um, abuse of criticism of, of woke if we made some criticism ourselves, and, you know, and then said, nevertheless, um, you know, these are the principles that I stand for, and they're very definitely progressive. They're very definitely anti-racist because they're universalist. Same reason why they're anti-sexist. Um, yeah, I, 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 well, I think it's both and. I, I mean, I think self-criticism, and it isn't self-criticism, let's be honest, it's criticism of a particular faction of the self-defined left. Uh, and I think it's both. I mean, it's when you're talking about Biden, being too explicit about race, that's a kind of self-criticism. When you're talking about criticizing the, the extreme use of politically correct language, that's not you and me criticizing ourselves, that's you and me criticizing somebody who professes to be on the left, but is really doing the work of the right. But then we also, I think, have to be much more forthright in, in calling out which of DeSantis's uh, uh, tricks are just BS and calling them out as BS. So this is tricky. This is walking and chewing gum at the same time and then some. It's doing a lot of different things, whereas the right can be more simple-minded, can be more sloganeering. It's it's always harder to be on the left because we value complexity and that's, right. that's just value simplicity. And so our, our road is always harder. I agree with you. And I think that um, woke is really, you know, historically, if if we can speak historically of you know what's happened in the past few years, um, it's a it's a reaction to the simplicity of the right. Okay, by again trying to set up a set of rules uh, by which you can decide whether a you know political action or a cultural action is um, acceptable or not, and I you know I I think it's important I. I tried, I am a philosopher, I, I try very hard to write for the general public and not, you know, to, to uh, try to make things um, comprehensible without being too simplified or reductive. And that's something that you actually have to work at. And I feel like a lot of people have left don't put in the time. It's a matter of cultivating a certain kind of style, which I'd be happy if more people, um, you know, joined into that project. So you're right, it's harder because we have a more complicated view of the world, but um, I, think it's, I think it's possible to get across. Well, the book, which I highly recommend, and I'll end on this note, is a kind of wonderful mix of polemic and um, quite erudite uh, teaching. I learned a few things that I hadn't known about, but it was a pleasure to learn them. And I think you've, you've blended the, the moral philosophy part uh, and a little bit of teaching that will come as news to people who thought they knew their history with, with the polemical part. So I'm glad you wrote it and uh, I wish you well with it. And I look forward to a conversation with you on your next book. Thanks very much, Bob. Thanks, Susan. Bye-bye. Yeah, this was great. Oh.